Well, welcome to another Friday night. Last week we started looking at the subconscious brain. And my goal was to really help us begin to understand just how powerful it is, what it controls in our daily life, and because of complex trauma, how you can get a whole bunch of maladaptive programs in your subconscious brain that are running the show and causing you all kinds of trouble in adult life and you're not even aware of why you're doing some of the stuff that you're doing. And we got into norms and priming and really tried to explain what that was about. And so today I want to make this really practical and, and go into the norms part a little bit more and look at it from the perspective of templates. That what happens in your subconscious brain is that in childhood, it's setting up templates of what is normal for it. Just for example, I've had many clients over the years that have said to me when I was a child, I used to say, I'm never going to be like my dad, he's so angry. And then I ended up like my dad. Why? Or somebody said, well, as a child, I hated my mom so much. I said, I'm never going to marry a woman like my mom. And then 30 years later, I find out I married a woman like my mom. What's that all about? That's the subconscious brain because of the templates it set for what feels normal, what is normal. And so I really want to dig into this today and, and help us really see how big this templates thing is as far as the damage it can do to relationships, the damage we do to ourselves because of complex trauma and how it programmed our subconscious brain. Carl Jung has said, until you make the unconscious conscious, it will rule your life and you will call it fate. In other words, what he's recognizing is as long as this subconscious programming operates undetected, below the radar, that you're not aware of it, it is going to actually run your life. It's going to be more powerful than what is going on in your conscious brain. And so until you make that unconscious, bring it into the conscious and become aware of it, then you can change it and then it loses its power. That's what we're going to really be developing today. Just as a side note, some people have referred to this maladaptive unconscious programming as their shadow side or their shadow self or their dark side. Because of the maladaptive programming, it desires some not so good things. And so that's just another set of terminology that you can be aware of as we dig into this. So let's begin by looking at the first template of who you're attracted to. Okay, so we've already talked about this with I'm not going to be like my dad and you end up like your dad. So take a child growing up in complex trauma and they have a dad who's a narcissist, who's very angry, who's emotionally unavailable, or they have a mother who's controlling, who's negative, who's always criticizing them. So you've got that as your normal. So the child can't escape that. The child just has to learn how to live with that, how to manage that, how to still try to get their needs met within that. And the child still has a love for that person, even though they kind of are developing a heat for that person. They still want validation from that person. They still want that person to be what they know that person should be to them. So there's all kinds of things going on inside of them. But what is happening in that child is they're learning how to relate to their dad, the narcissist, the angry person, the emotionally unavailable person. They're learning how to relate to their mom, the negative, critical, controlling person. That's becoming their normal. That's becoming comfortable. That's becoming what they feel secure in a relationship like that because they know what to do. It's what they've learned how to do. And so they come into adult life with this, I'm never going to be like my dad. I'm never going to marry somebody like my mom. And the problem is they end up married to uh, somebody like their mom and they end up becoming like their dad. What happened there? It's that subconscious programming, the template that was set up that they learned to relate to a narcissist who's emotionally unavailable, to a controlling person who's negative and critical. 
But what I want you to see is that became their comfort level. That felt good. There's, there was a sense of security in that. So that now, 25 years later, when they meet somebody who's a narcissist, who's emotionally unavailable, something deep inside of their subconscious immediately feels comfortable. It immediately feels, I know what to do here. There's a sense of, oh, I can relax. This, this feels normal. And they're attracted to that. They meet somebody like negative, controlling, and I know what to do here. This feels normal. And they're attracted to that. So what I want you to see is their conscious level was saying, I'm never going to be like their dad. But their subconscious level was attracted to somebody like their dad because it felt normal. What was the most powerful? The subconscious. And that's where they ended up with somebody like their dad. And so that's why we say, until you bring that subconscious that you're not even aware of to the conscious level and be aware of what's going on, what that template looks like, you can't change it. And that subconscious will continue to control you to be the most powerful force when it comes to who you're attracted to. Now, let me point out a couple things here. Do you realize then that your conscious level and your subconscious level are operating by two different sets of beliefs and desires? They're, they have different priorities. So your conscious level, I'm never going to be like my dad. Your subconscious, I want somebody like my dad because it feels comfortable. And so that's competing desires are coming out in you one at the conscious, one at the subconscious, and they're opposite. Second thing I want you to see is that your subconscious level, which is that powerful part, it is operating off of the distorted beliefs that came out of their complex trauma. And many of those beliefs are lies. Many of those beliefs are destructive to self and to others. But it was their normal. It's what they grew up with. It's what they were made to believe because of their experience. And so the subconscious programming is operating off a set of faulty beliefs, whereas the conscious might be operating off of true beliefs, truth, but the subconscious is the most powerful. And so that's what we're bringing to the, need to bring to the conscious level, is all of this faulty programming with its lies and beliefs and distortions, then we can begin to change it. Now let me add something else here that's really important to understand. Somebody has pointed out that if we have something in adult life, often it's proof that we something in us wanted it. So if you end up with somebody like your dad, it's evidence that even though your conscious brain didn't want something like your dad, something deep inside of you wanted your dad. Something deep inside of you wanted somebody like your mom. And that's what we're seeing here is we need to understand the desires of this subconscious level because what we find is often they're desiring things that are harmful to us, things that are not going to be good for us or relationships, but we're desiring it. Why? Because it gives us a sense of comfort, security. It feels normal. We almost actually feel safe there because we've been here before and know what to do. And so we desire something that is harmful to us. So that's this, another concept that's important to understand. It's called psychological masochism. And what it means is that in our subconscious brain, we are desiring what feels normal, but often that is what is painful. It is what is going to hurt us and do harm to us. So it's almost like Something in us is masochistic. It desires something that's going to hurt us and be painful. And so what is I want you to understand is as long as we have all of these maladaptive subconscious programs with their desires for what feels normal, even though it's harmful, we are going to de desire bad things in our lives and we're going to keep doing bad things without realizing why. And it's because this deep level within us is desiring that because it feels normal. Now, let me add one more thing before we move on. 
A lot of people, when they start to bring this subconscious level, which has got their shadow side, which has got all this maladaptive programming and lies and kind of wanting bad things, when they start to bring it to the conscious level, something in them resists it. And the reason is they resist looking at, this is part of me? I want this stuff? Oh, that that just triggers shame. That just triggers, wow, this is part of me. That makes me even worse a person than I thought I was. And so I, I need I need to deny this. I need to repress this. I need to just be positive. I need to just get to my conscious brain and live out of my conscious brain. What I want you to see is in order to change, we have to face our shadow side. We have to face our dark side. We have to be willing to look at that. But we don't look at it to be down on it, to beat ourselves up, to judge it that this is a bad person. What I want you to see is a perspective that says, hey, that child back then, it didn't choose to do this bad stuff because it wanted to. It did it to survive. And that child back then, it was put in an environment that wasn't healthy, so it developed templates based on what was its normal, but it didn't choose what its normal was. It was handed to it. It had narcissistic parents. It had controlling parents. It was trying to survive in a very unhealthy situation. And so that child doesn't need to be beaten up. That child needs compassion. That child needs understanding. And so as I bring all of this subconscious programming which is kind of dark and dirty and messy, to the surface, I'm not going to be judging it. I'm going to have a compassion to it and try to understand it. Okay, let's go to a second template. And it's how we got value. So in complex trauma, a child who's abused and neglected, they basically begin to conclude, I must not have any value. That's why I'm being neglected and abused and criticized. So I must be a zero. I must not be worth anything. So I have no inherent value. But I I want value. So the only way I'm going to get value is to get validated for doing things, for performing, for my body, for my looks, for my brains, for my money, for my possessions, for my position. But I have to perform all the time in order to get value. So that becomes their value template template that value comes from externals. Value comes from performance, from doing, not from inherent. Well, then they get into recovery and they learn they have value inherently. Their parents didn't recognize it or acknowledge it, but it didn't mean they didn't have it. So they start to consciously go, okay, I have value. I Don't need others to validate me in order to have value. I inherently have value. I don't need to use my body or my possessions or my what I do in order to gain value. I already have value. So let's take that to a woman who's always gained her sense of value from her body and her looks and how she performs sexually. And she gets to a point in recovery where she goes, I'm tired of gaining my sense of value from my body, from my sexual performance. I'm tired of having men only wanting me for sex, of just being a piece of meat to men. I badly want a relationship where men value me just for me, not for just my body or for my sexual performance. So I think I am going to Now go out socially, and I'm not going to put on any makeup. I'm not going to dress up. I'm just going to go out comfortably, and I'm not going to be sexually flirtatious with any men. I'm just going to go and sit and engage naturally. That's a wonderful decision for them. They're really valuing the value they inherently have. The problem is they go out, and for five nights in a row, No men notice them. They don't get any validation. They don't get any attention. Nobody seems to desire them. And that triggers their subconscious template. And that triggers shame and fear. And they start to go, "Uh uh-oh, 
This is proving I don't have any value inherently. Nobody wants me just for me. That proves my value only comes from my body. And the only time I will ever get desired is if I'm flirtatious and if I dress up. So if I don't start going back to flirting and and dressing up and drawing attention to my body, I'm going to be alone forever. Nobody's going to ever want a relationship with me. I will be unloved forever. And so what do they do? They go back to flirting again. The very thing their conscious brain decided not to do. They go back to the very thing they hate, the thing they were trying to quit. And what I want you to see is the subconscious trumped the conscious. It had more power in the end. And that is, happens so frequently. Let's go to another template. The fear of abandonment template. So what comes out of complex trauma for many people is that they feel all alone, that nobody's there for them, that they've been abandoned. Sometimes they are literally abandoned. And what goes on in their subconscious brain is, if I try to be authentic, nobody ever wants to connect with me. They criticize me, they reject me, they make fun of me. So authenticity never leads to connection. It always leads to abandonment. So never be authentic. So that's their subconscious template. Now they come into recovery. They recognize that they have felt alone and unloved for years. They've tried to wear masks. They've tried to people please, but it hasn't satisfied them. And now they come into recovery and they begin to learn that true deep intimacy and love happens only when two safe people can be authentic with each other. And they go, yes, I get it. Authenticity leads to deep connection. But do you see that's the opposite of what their subconscious believes? And so you have two, your conscious and your subconscious in disagreement. But they go, okay, I am going to get into a relationship with a safe person. I'm going to begin to become authentic. And I'm going to trust that that person is going to accept me, love me. We're going to form a deep connection And I'm going to get that connection and love that I've always been craving. But what happens? They start to get into a relationship with somebody and they start to like this person and it starts triggering their subconscious brain, which says, okay, you know what? Authenticity in your past always led to rejection. Don't go there. Because rejection and abandonment, that's the greatest pain there is. Just to feel like a zero, like feel totally alone, totally unlovable. You don't want to experience that again. So let's try a couple different things. Number one, don't totally open up. Keep on masks and walls and just kind of let them in so far, but not totally be authentic. And so some people go that route. Or open up, but let's be controlling of them and jealous so that we don't let them have any other friends so that they only have us. That way they'll never abandon us. Some go that way. Others go, let's try to test them all the time to see if they still love us and that we're still the most important person. So let's create crises. Let's let's accuse them of different things just to see how they respond. What's going on there? Your subconscious is running the show based on the belief that authenticity will equal abandonment. Anybody that gets to know me will eventually abandon me. But what are you doing? All of those actions that you are doing from testing a person, controlling a person, from keeping walls and masks in place, is you're driving the other person away. You're creating the circumstances where they're going to eventually abandon you. You're creating the thing you're trying to prevent. But your subconscious brain is running the show. It is trumping your conscious brain. Another template. Not all of you will have this, but some of you will. For some, part of their complex trauma comes out of growing up in poverty, where their parents were very poor, they lived in a very poor neighborhood, 
But what happened with that is their parents would often try to put a positive spin on their poverty. That we've learned to be content with what we have. We give away. We don't need what all those people who are self-indulgent need. And so there's a whole bunch of stuff that they do to try to justify that being poor is actually righteous. That becomes your template. What happens for some people when they then get into adult life and recovery is they go, conscious brain, I want to start not living paycheck to paycheck. I'm tired of the stress of all the financial shortcomings. I I want to make a good enough income that I can put some away. I can relax a little bit, travel a little bit. But what they find is they still remain in poverty. They still keep living paycheck to paycheck. And they go, what's going on here? I'm I'm getting good jobs. Why can't I get out of this poverty? It's the subconscious template. And what could be going on in that subconscious template? Well, number one, it could be shame. I have always been poor. And out of that, I believed I wasn't good enough. That was part of my complex trauma. And so now I don't believe I deserve a better life. I don't believe I deserve good things. Or it could be poverty feels normal. And so something in me sabotages any moves out of poverty so that I end up back at poverty so that I feel normal. Or it could be, you know what, in poverty, I didn't have lots of responsibilities and tough decisions to make about life and investment and and what being responsible with my money. So I don't like responsibility. I want to go back to just kind of a very, very, very simple life and poverty gives me that. Or for some, my parents not only were poor, but I didn't have any tools taught to me about how to handle money. And so now when I get money, it just creates so much stress because I don't know what to do with it and I make bad decisions with it because I don't have tools. (laughs) And I don't want to learn all those tools. It's just too hard at my age. So let's go back to poverty. So what you find is the subconscious has trumped the conscious. And it keeps bringing you back to what feels normal, even though you're trying to get away from that. Let's go to another template. Many that come out of complex trauma, because they couldn't fight or flight, they learn to fawn. And that was people please. That was don't set boundaries. Don't say no to anybody. Because if you say no, they might get mad at you. Or if you say no, they might not like you anymore. And you need them to like you. So become a people pleaser. Always do what people want. And that became their normal. That became their template. So give up your needs. Give up your rights. Make sacrifice, sacrifice, sacrifice. That's the only way you're going to get people to like you. That's the only way you're going to get your needs met. That's going to be the solution to not feeling good about yourself as if you get everybody else to like you. That's their subconscious template. But they get into adult life and recovery and they start to realize this people pleasing and not setting boundaries and not saying no, people are using me. People are taking advantage of me. I'm burning out. I'm developing resentments against people. I'm tired all the time. I'm not taking care of myself properly. I got to change that. And so their conscious brain makes that decision. But then they find they can't. For some reason, they're still not setting boundaries very well or enforcing them. They're still people pleasing. What's going on? Why can't they stop this? Subconscious template. What's going on inside of them is, I still need people to like me. I'm afraid that if I stand up for myself, everybody's going to be mad at me. And I just don't have the strength or backbone to stand up for myself and say, I need this. This is my right. And so I keep going back to, I need everybody to like me. I need everybody to like me. And so the shame stuff, the fear of people not liking me and abandoning me causes the subconscious to trump the conscious. That happens for so many people over and over again. 
Okay, so let me keep going on with other templates. I'm just going to speed it up a little bit. A lot of people have said to me over the time, over my years in working in this field, I got to deal with my anger. I, I'm having all these anger explosions. So at a conscious level, they got to stop this. But then they're not successful. Why? Because their subconscious template needs anger. It needs anger so that they don't feel other emotions. It needs anger so that it's kind of a guard around their heart. Nobody can hurt me if I'm angry and I'm lashing out. It allows me to control people. It gives me energy. It allows me to feel self-righteous. And so anger is their default norm, their template, and something in their subconscious has to go back to feeling anger to feel normal because it gives so many benefits. They think, even though it does so much damage. Another one. So many people go, I got to stop overeating. I got to stop using food to numb my emotions. So every time they're feeling stress, every time they're feeling anxiety, every time they're feeling depression, they eat. They overeat. And they're beginning to get really tired of it. And so they've tried different diets. They work for a little bit, then they don't. And, and so now they're basically at a point where they go, I got to stop this. But they can't. They're not successful. Why? Because the subconscious templates, what do they say? I need food as my medication for unpleasant emotions. So if I'm feeling guilt, if I'm feeling shame, if I'm feeling lonely, if I'm feeling anger, if I'm feeling frustrated, if I'm feeling fear, I need to eat as a way to medicate and not feel those things. It's my distraction. It's my medication. And that trumps what their conscious brain wants to do. Another template that many have is around chaos. So you grow up in chaos. Chaos becomes normal. You got stuff falling apart all the time, stuff blowing up all the time. You got people angry at each other all the time. You got a messy house. You got disorganization. You got lack of routine. You just got people going all over the place. That's your normal. There's always a crisis. There's always something going down. Then you get into recovery and you go, wow, I don't want to live like that anymore. That is just awful. But what's your subconscious template? I need chaos to not feel bored. I need chaos to not feel other emotions. I need chaos to be distracted from my problems and, and I can just focus on my external problems. And so your subconscious is drawn to create chaos in order to meet what it thinks is its need, that desire for chaos. Your unconscious trumps your conscious. Another template, control. Many people coming out of complex trauma where their needs weren't met begin to become controlling in order to try to get their needs met consistently. If I'm in control, I can get my needs met. I won't get hurt. So they become that way. And then they're that way with their children. But then they notice their children are starting to rebel. They notice that, okay, this isn't healthy. This is not good parenting. I need to stop being so controlling. That's their conscious brain. But what happens? They've got a subconscious template. And the subconscious template is, if I'm not in control, something bad might happen. I might fail. My kids might fail. I'm going to feel terrible. I'm going to feel like a failure. I'm going to look bad. i got to remain in control. And so the subconscious trumps the conscious and they continue to be a controlling parent even though they see the damage that it's doing. Okay, let me just add a whole bunch of other ones that might apply to you. You might go, I'm so sensitive, I got to stop taking everything personally. That's your conscious brain. But then, for some reason, you still take everything personally. That's your subconscious template, that everything's about me negatively. Another one, I got to stop habitually seeking approval. 
I got to stop doing things to get people to like me, even though I don't agree with some of the stuff I'm doing. I go against my values. I I neglect my needs. I got to stop doing that, but then you end up doing it. Subconscious template. I got to stop picking a fight with my partner just when everything starts getting good with my partner. It's like I keep sabotaging good stuff. Conscious, I got to stop doing this. Subconscious, I'm going to sabotage because I need it. I got to stop disliking myself and my body no matter what shape it's in. And so for some, I need that body in order to get attention. That's the subconscious. Or they were always told by their parents, no matter how pretty they were, how ugly they were. And so subconscious templates that are there that is now causing all kinds of problems. Or I got to start being more creative. I want to be creative. But what I find is I keep avoiding creativity because every time I'm creative, I hear my third grade teacher's voice in my head criticizing everything I try. That's the subconscious template. That keeps sabotaging any creative events that you have today. Or another one, you have these great plans for the future, but you never get around to doing them. Why? Subconscious programming that somehow keeps you from pursuing those goals, getting your hopes up. Another one, the victim template. I have to stop blaming everybody for all my problems in my life. So my family, my boss, my spouse, my employees, the government, the blacks, the gays, the straights, the whites, the Jews, the Christians, the capitalists, the hippies, etc., etc., etc. I have to stop saying it's all their fault for all my problems. But what's going on? The subconscious brain wants to be a victim. It wants to feel helpless, even though your conscious brain doesn't want to be in this helpless state, this victim mentality. Subconscious trumps conscious. So those are a whole bunch of different templates. Now let me just take it a little different direction, and I hope this will just help make some sense of stuff for you. Take, for example, a term that we refer to as transference. So transference is when, and you may have gone through this, you meet somebody and all of a sudden you just don't like them. You have immediate dislike for them. You don't know why. It's often because of a subconscious template. Your subconscious is picking up some clues that that person is like the ant that used to be mean to you or that you just were always criticized by. And so now you meet this person and your subconscious immediately doesn't like them because it's transferring certain characteristics that they're displaying and connecting them to your aunt. All happening at a subconscious level. And that happens all the time with people. So transference is another template effect. Another template effect is what we call the halo effect. And what that really means is When you meet somebody and all of a sudden it's like you put a halo on them. They're just something and you just likes them. You just like something about them and then conclude because you like that thing about them. So let's say they're very pretty or they're the same religion as you. All of a sudden you then assume they must be better than other people. They must be more moral than other people. They must be nicer than other people. They must have all of these certain standards that you just assume. That's the halo effect. And so it's when your initial perception of somebody is positive because of some external fact about them, you then conclude all these other positive things about them. And you could be totally wrong. And so sometimes it's referred to as the physical attractiveness stereotype. So what is beautiful must be good. And so you meet somebody that's just stunningly beautiful, and then you just assume they must be virtuous, wonderful, kind, loving. That's the halo effect. That's built on all of that subconscious template. Another direction with this, there's certain deep templates that are default setting templates that come around emotions. So for example, Some people coming out of complex trauma have a default guilt template. 
They were made to feel guilty about everything all their life. Everything was their fault. If they relaxed, they were told they were selfish. They were lazy. All of guilt, 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 guilt. That became their normal. They just get used to feeling guilty. And then they beat themselves up all the time. And that becomes their normal, that they need to be punished on themselves and be down on themselves for something. And so now what begins to happen in recovery is without realizing it, their brain is still looking for something that they're doing that they can criticize so they'll feel guilty, so they can get down on themselves. And that keeps them stuck in their progress in recovery. But that's a default subconscious brain template. Another one is a default of depression where a person has been so depressed about their life, about shame, I don't like myself, nothing ever works out, everything sucks. That's been their normal for years and years. Every time they've tried to resolve it, to better themselves, it hasn't worked out. And they've just ended up in this ugly, drab, dreary place over and over again, and that's their normal. Their subconscious has got used to that. Their subconscious expects that. And so now what happens is if they have a good day where everything is going good and they actually feel good, they get uncomfortable. Do I get my hopes up? My life's going to get better? What do I do with this? I don't like this. This, this is making me feel very nervous because usually the other shoe is going to drop and something bad's going to happen. So let's just sabotage that and go back to feeling depressed because at least we know what to do with feeling depressed. That's our normal. And so that's Again, a default network that's a template. Others have a default fear network. They need to feel fear and anxiety at a deep level in order to feel normal, that life is okay. And so they go through life because of all the stuff that happened in the past, all the uncertainty where they just have fear about men. Men are going to hurt me. They have a fear about all kinds of different things that they're going to get hurt. And so now when they go into a situation and they don't feel fear, all of a sudden they're, they're nervous. I sh what's going on here? I don't like this. I don't like this. So they will look for something negative. They will look for something to focus on to bring the fear back. And so if you take it in the context of a person who develops a fear of men because all men in their past were unhealthy, were hurtful, were abusive, and now they come into adult life, and let's say they meet a, a man that's super safe, etc., but their fear says, no, no, you can't, can't, can't open yourself up to that. You might get hurt again. So what do they do? Let's look for some type of fault. Let's try to find something wrong so that we can be afraid of this person and go back to fear. A fear default template. One of the biggest default templates is shame where I need to feel shame to feel normal. I need to feel not good enough, not valuable to feel normal. If I ever feel too good about myself, that, that makes me uncomfortable. I got to go back to feeling shame. And so that is fed by all kinds of things from the past, but it, it keeps controlling people today. And so my value comes from my external accomplishments only. They keep sliding back into that. That's part of the shame template. If I spend time relaxing or doing something that interests me, that means I'm not accomplishing anything. I'm being selfish. I'm being lazy. I'm being useless. If people are nice to me, it, it must be because they don't really know who I am or they're just trying to manipulate me somehow. They go back to believing that over and over again. That's part of the shame template. If people ever question my ideas or my advice, they must think I'm stupid. They go back to that belief over and over again. People who are nice to me are probably saying bad things behind my back. That, that just remains part of that template. Deep down, I don't think I can do anything right. Deep down, I feel like I'm a failure. And so I need to find fault with everything that I do because there's probably fault there. And so that constant internal critic, any failure means I am a failure. That's all part of that default shame template. The default flight template. So for some people in complex trauma, they just learn to flee every time things got uncomfortable, frustrating, every time there was anger, every time there was difficulty, 
flight, flight, because somebody's going to get hurt. And that flight tendency became a pattern, became their normal, became a default network. And so now, as soon as they get into a situation that has the slightest bit of aggravation, hassle, conflict, extra work required, I'm out of here. They numb, they avoid, they try to get out. Whenever they feel any uncomfortable emotion, depression, anxiety, stress, exhaustion, I'm out of here. Flight kicks in, always resulting in the slightest little thing that's difficult. I need to numb, avoid, distract, medicate. That has become a subconscious template for many people with complex trauma. So if you can become aware of that, that will help you so much. So that's about almost 25 different templates that operate at a subconscious level with people. I hope you're able to see yourself. Some of you might be kind of sh shocked that you have all 25 of those templates. And you're going, whoa, all of that's been operating at a subconscious level. So back to what Carl Jung said, we got to bring that to a conscious level so we can change it. If we don't, it's still going to control us. It's still going to cause us to desire what's harmful for us and do damage to us and to relationships. And so I hope this will just help you begin that process. Well, that's the end of another Friday night. I hope that was helpful.